Oh, it's you. It's been a long time. Kill all sons of bitches, right? Decided Valve has no more chances and must pay three million Australian dollars. God, Gavin, you suck so much penis at making video games. The only thing that's keeping Counter Strike alive is all is all the esports behind it. For a company that makes so much money, Valve is surprisingly risk averse. They also seem, in the main, to be people that are people that just don't want the spotlight. They're people that just don't really want to be out there. But there is something really admirable about the fact that Valve makes games because they think that that game can change. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Now, for all of the smoke and mirrors, Valve isn't a faceless corporate entity. Quite the opposite. Its face is very well known and loved. Gabe Newell. Welcome to the International. Valve's CEO and founding partner, Gabe Newell, or Gaben as he is commonly referred to, has cemented his spot as a benevolent god of gamers worldwide. Hi, my name is Gabe Newell. I'm the managing director at Valve. Our first game was Half-Life and I'd like to say hello to all the GameStar readers. Valve's journey began in 1996, when Gaben left Microsoft with fellow employee Mike Harrington to found their own gaming development company. We both thought that there was a pretty good chance uh, that we were gonna go take a stab at this for a year, fail miserably, and then tuck our tails between our legs and go back to, to working at Microsoft. The pair was convinced that video games were the future of entertainment and were eager to throw their hats into the ring. We're going to be seeing these guys a lot tonight. Half-Life, Valve Software. Harrington eventually split from Valve, leaving the company entirely in Gaben's capable hands. Sitting at over a $4 billion net worth, Valve's president somehow manages to project and maintain a down-to-earth everyman image, even going so far as publicly sharing his email should anyone want to get in touch. Please email me at gaben at valvesoftware.com and let me know about your rampage. I'm not wearing underwear. As unlikely as direct communication with a billionaire seems, the email address is, in fact, real and functional, and a lucky few get a response now and then. However, following that story hitting some mainstream media attention, Gabe Newell started to answer quite a few community questions regarding the situation of these layoffs and if they had affected Valve's development in any way. First of all, Mr. Newell answered the question that it was 13 full-time employees and it was a people thing, not a hardware thing. Valve is often hailed for their contribution to the growth of the gaming industry, particularly the creation and development of Steam, a digital gaming distribution platform so influential it has become synonymous with PC gaming in general. They've, they've contributed an enormous amount to helping the esports ecosystem overall and they've stayed hands off here's some tools here's some stuff we'll try and support you where we can but otherwise please get on with it just like valve itself steam has changed dramatically over the years it was first introduced on september 12 2003 as a way for gamers to keep their valve titles patched and up to date at a time when only about 20% of people had a broadband connection in their home, requiring users to be connected constantly was a tall order. And so, Steam floundered. Before Steam was even a twinkle in Gaben's eye, Valve put out a few titles, most notably the universally acclaimed FPS phenomenon, Half-Life. 
Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. Half-Life ushered in a new generation of FPS games, receiving numerous Best Game Awards and even leading to Counter-Strike, which was originally a mod of that game. Uh, it was just one of many mods that got dropped out of Half uh, out of Half Life being the most amazing game engine. The fan base clamored for a sequel, and Valve delivered. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Half-Life 2 was incredible, such a revolutionary game from a lot of perspectives. And the thing that really stands out about it is that just like Half-Life 1 totally changed first-person shooters, Half-Life 2 just did it again. It did that same kind of roller coastery style of like, you know, you're just being pushed through levels, but it had things that were totally different, levels that really stood out. Obviously the gravity gun is like the huge standout that everybody remembers, but there are plenty of things in Half-Life 2 that made people just lose their minds, feel like they were playing video games again for the first time. But there was a catch. The only way to get your hands on Half-Life 2 was to sign up for Steam, making Half-Life 2 the vehicle that made Steam more than a failed experiment. But there was a catch. You see, Half-Life 2 required you to log into Steam and download it through Steam. You couldn't just go ahead and play the game freely. And I'm telling you, a lot of people did not know this, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Instantly, Valve had ingeniously locked people into getting Steam. And with an influx of users, the platform grew. In 2005, Valve allowed third-party releases onto Steam for a cut of the profits made from digital sales. Ragdoll Kung Fu and Darwinia were the first non-Valve games made available on Steam, marking its transition into a fully functional digital store. As more and more titles came pouring in, it was full Steam ahead for Valve. <laughs> By 2010, Valve made more profit per employee than either Google or Apple. In short, Valve has fuck you money. Actually, they have fuck me money. Today, Steam monopolizes a significant portion of the digital sales market for games. By moving their wares from the physical to the digital realm, Valve kickstarted a change that helped revolutionize the way we consume media. Steam created the digital market and it nurtured it, grew it into a multi-billion dollar industry to the point where most PC players don't buy any physical games, and those that do aren't surprised to find a Steam key inside their game case. But Valve wasn't just concerned with the digital migration of games. The company's foray into the world of user-generated content has also been a huge success. Valve bought the intellectual property rights to Counter-Strike, a mod of Valve's own Half-Life, in 1999. In 2010, Valve acquired the rights to Dota 2, a mod of a Warcraft 3 map from its lead developer Icefrog and creator U. Needless to say, both Dota 2 and CS have been extremely worthwhile investments. Every time that you guys play a match or create an item or contribute to the compendium, you're helping make Dota better for the rest of us. Valve also created a space for users to submit their own content, including mods and cosmetics that others could purchase through Steam. And not only that, they've also been very supportive of mods over the years as well. If you think about it, you know, Half-Life Half -Life is the original game. Counter-Strike is a mod, Dota is a mod. Uh, Underlords is kind of an evolution of a mod of a game. And so they've been very open to that. They've hired people in. Um, almost all of the people that work on these games, originally at least, were, were mod makers. Allowing user-generated content to flourish on Steam turned out to be a bit of a double-edged sword, though. Valve embraced it for its obvious advantages, a fast turnover of ideas and free beta testing of new concepts, all done by the community itself at no cost to the gaming giant. Here at Valve, we have a unique perspective on UGC. Some of our most popular game franchises started off as mods of other games. Because of this background, many of our products directly support UGC in one way or another. So we've truly seen the power of it firsthand. The disadvantages, of course, were the torrents of content being added to Steam, some of it poorly made or offensive. But the floodgate had been opened. Internally, Valve went through some significant changes since its early days. The company chose to phase out the levels of its corporate hierarchy. Valve decided that labeling anything other than the top execs manager was redundant and stifling. 
The employees could now move freely between projects and departments, putting their creative talents towards whatever happened to strike their fancy. In theory, the lack of structure would allow for a greater freedom of expression and a flow of creative juices within the company. It all makes you wonder, how does Valve maintain focus with such an open structure? How does a company this unpredictable decide what it wants to do next? And above all, what sort of people does it take to succeed in this type of environment? The downside, of course, was more accountability for individual mistakes. For a company that makes so much money, Valve is surprisingly risk-averse. New projects, internal tools, dev, infra dev infrastructure, and anything that doesn't contribute to a current product are met with disdain. This is only meaningful to company rock stars, but there are necessary tasks that comes with producing successful products that people are reluctant to pick up at times because they're not se because they're not sexy products. Not Having a managerial system in place also meant deadlines weren't being enforced and projects were sometimes left to languish for years or just cancelled outright. And the departure of talent who led the work on earlier releases left several big titles in limbo. But Left 4 Dead 3 was cancelled in late 2016 or early 2017 because the team couldn't make a decision on exactly what engine they were going to continue developing, and so an almost finished game, only needing the final pass of art and voice acting, was cancelled, and never to be seen again. The community began to question whether the developers at Valve were capable of counting to three, as any significant releases seemed stuck on their second iterations. Left 4 Dead 2, Team Fortress 2, Half-Life 2, Episode 2, the list goes on. Your motivation is three kills. Just give me anything, anything you want. Say whatever, okay? I don't, I don't care. You've killed more than two people and less than four. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, that's technically right. You, you nailed it, we're good. Yeah, game in. Now, until very recently, Half-Life 3 was the primary entry on that list of unrealized thirds. But after a 15-year wait, the fans can finally look forward to a new installment of the beloved franchise, Half-Life Alex in VR. While it is a prequel, not a sequel, and the VR bit of the announcement was a disappointment for some fans, there's no doubt that the long-anticipated release got a lot of hearts pumping. You gotta realize, people have been waiting 20 years! Or more for for you know uh, this stuff. Cool. Thumbs up, if you men. What? Okay, okay. He's been hyped. A question that often comes up where Valve is concerned is whether Valve is truly the good guy the community makes it out to be. Despite the billion dollar offer, CEO Gabe Newell said Valve would rather disintegrate than ever sell out. Too often, Valve has been an absent parent to some of its releases, allowing bugs to wreak havoc on in-game economies and OP guns to destroy metas. Okay, is that how Counter-Strike works now? This guy's just gonna go like that and I'm dead? You literally see like his fucking shoulder patch and you just die from a pistol from that far away? God, Gaben, you suck so much penis at making video games. It fucking hurts me, bro. It fucking, you're so rich. It's insane. How could you not fix this fucking game? Sorry, sorry, chat. And fed up gamers are not the only ones finding fault with how Valve conducts itself. In the landmark court case of Valve versus the Australian government, the company was found to be in violation of the country's good business practices and was ordered to pay a $3 million fine as a result. Then, as of June 2015, Valve started to offer refunds across their entire storefront, and Valve not only argued this was sufficient, but they did not need to follow local law because their company does not operate locally. The ACCC said no to both of these things, and after appeals, it has been decided Valve has no more chances and must pay 3 million Australian dollars. Before the historic ruling took place, Valve never offered refunds of any kind on any of their digital purchases. If you bought something from Steam, the sale was final. In what was seen as a gesture of goodwill by Valve towards their consumer base, all refund requests made within 14 days of purchase or before the game was played for more than two hours were automatically approved. It wasn't any grand gesture on Valve's part as so many had treated them as the last great pro-consumer entity out there at the time. It was due to legal pressures as a result of this one lawsuit. And as I said, Valve's implementing their refund policy was not out of any pro-consumer leaning. It was wholly motivated out of self-preservation and self-interest. 
the Australian case wasn't the first or the last time Val found itself embroiled in a lengthy court battle. Former partner disputes, intellectual property ownership claims, consumer rights group lawsuits, skin gambling scandals, geo-blocking accusations… Valve's legal history is a dark and thorny place. And the law isn't the only thing that Valve has had to struggle against. Now, it's not Half-Life 3, for what it's worth. It's not a new hero. But Valve has a new game coming soon. You're not giving me the appropriate reaction that deserves. <laughs> Artifact, Valve's first release in years, bombed so badly that 95% of its active player base dropped the game a mere two months in. Destroy an enemy artifact? But Artifact is already dead. By July 2019, the game boasted fewer than 100 players, putting Artifact into its own category of dead game. Artifact simply had too many problems. Deep-rooted issues with the gameplay and the fact that the game wasn't free to play unlike some of its biggest competitors left loyal Valve fans tangibly disappointed. I will be really disappointed if um, the economy ends up being just like the biggest shortcoming with the game. Because I really actually enjoy the game itself, but I mean, they can't release it like this. Combined, these factors led to Artifact's swift demise. But uh, I do wish we could have uh, uh, figured out a way to manage uh, our relationship with the uh, with the fans better, because uh, because in the end, I think that uh, the game was a very very good game, but uh, not necessarily for everybody. But just because Artifact got off to a rough start, it doesn't mean that Valve has given up on it just yet. Any definite revival plans, however, are yet to be announced. Not one to be deterred by a silly thing like a failed game, Valve continued working on its many other ventures. The International 2019 had over 1.1 million viewers on Twitch during the Grand Finals, the most ever for a Dota 2 event. Steam's Remote Play Together beta feature was expanded to all users, and Valve announced that plans were already in the works for the next two CSGO majors. Additionally, in light of the success of mods like Dota Auto Chess, Valve is looking to reach deeper into the gaming market in countries like China, where Steam currently operates under grey market conditions. According to reports, the Steam store is still accessible, but the writing may very well be on the wall for the Valve-run gaming website in China. And if that's the case, Valve will be feeling the pinch. And to add to the growing list of its new undertakings, in 2018, Valve accidentally went live with a test server of Steam TV, Valve's own broadcasting platform and a possible rival to Twitch. This does raise a few questions. Is Valve attempting to take on the Twitch, the Mixter, the YouTube gaming marketplace? And if so, will they have any kind of revenue incentives for the people streaming on their platform? Valve has developed a reputation for playing favorites with their games. As I mentioned before, I looked into Dota 2 a little, but when I read through the pages of the update history, for Dota 2, it seems that they update their game pretty much daily with fixes and every month comes the fixes to champions or some massive content update. Every Valve release since 2004 has been running on their once groundbreaking engine, Source. And so far, the only game Valve ported over to Source 2 has been Dota 2. Meanwhile, Valve's other smash hit, CSGO, continues to suffer from a plethora of game-breaking bugs, frustrating its competitive community. The only thing that's keeping Counter-Strike alive is all is all the esports behind it. Mm -hmm. All the oh, sure. all the organizers what's keeping it alive, but, but the, the game itself as a whole is dying with none of these updates. As their two biggest esports investments, however, neither Dota 2 or CSGO are likely to go anywhere anytime soon. At this point, there's no telling exactly how lofty Valve's ambitions are. Valve seems to only be interested in making games when it's this huge earth-changing event, right? When it's TF2 basically inventing the class-based shooter. When it's Half-Life and Half-Life 2 revitalizing FPSs. When it's Half-Life Alex trying to be the game that sells people on VR. Valve wants to do the things that nobody else has done. And they're not doing it out of the goodness of their own heart, they want to make money. But there is something really admirable about the fact that Valve makes games because they think that that game can change everything. The question is, has Valve lived long enough to see itself become the gaming industry's villain? Or have they been unfairly painted as one by making decisions they feel are important, rather than bending to public opinion? A couple years ago, we started to think, we started to have these weird thoughts about economies and the importance of user-generated content and how the process that 
had given rise to steam was actually accelerating and that the most important developers were actually our customers. They're very normal, what I would call normal gaming fan. You know, they're fans of games. They love games, the same as we do. But they are in a fortunate position where they can produce these things and they can adapt and change games. But they also seem, in the main, to be people that are people that just don't want the spotlight. You know, people that just don't really want to be out there. No matter what the answer is, millions of people will always hold on to the valve that they remember. The Valve that didn't just raise the bar, but defined it. Whatever you think of them today, Valve set the benchmark every other gaming company strives to reach. And no matter what, that legacy is assured. But I think we can put our differences behind us. For science, you monster. Thanks for watching. If you want more content like this, hit the sub button and ring that notification bell. For unique bite-sized videos you won't find anywhere else, hit up our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages.